Thank you very much. Um, is that, yes, that's working fine. Um, it's uh, great. I've been here before, actually, twice, and it's really, really good to be back. And actually, I'm sure some of you feel it as well. I'm feeling a bit of a lump in my throat uh, just being able to do this, both, both digitally and, and here in front of a live audience. I'm going to talk about sustainability, um, and I'm going to talk about sustainability in the consumer, which is something we've been beginning to think about a lot. Um, I came here by train, so why did I do that? I did it because I wanted to have something to talk about with you, um, but I also did it, obviously, because I thought that was a sustainable alternative. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, uh, just as an introduction, about coming here by train and what it was like. Um, and there are two ways of looking at this. You can look at quantitative measurements, which is what I'm going to start with here. So, the travel time. So, according to trainline.com, the website in the UK where you can book trains all over the place, it was going to take 9 hours 13 minutes. The flight takes an hour and a half. So, that was worth thinking about. It turned out, because Deutsche Bahn didn't work quite so well, that the journey took 12 hours. So, you got 12 hours versus one and a half, although I don't know whether or not the plane I might have taken would have been delayed. Then you've got the ticket cost. So if I'd come via Ryanair, which I'd prefer not to have done, um, that would have cost pretty much half of what the train ticket cost. If I came on the more expensive British Airways flight, that would have cost roughly the same, there or thereabouts. Then you've got the carbon impact. That's the big tick. That's the win, as you might have guessed. Well, otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, and the carbon impact is, is roughly 31 kilos of carbon were emitted because I came by train and about 130 would have been emitted if I'd come by plane. Although, those numbers are a bit iffy, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And then you've got also, quantitatively, the time that it took me to find out the information about all of the things that I'm talking to you, or indeed to find out the information about the carbon efficiency. Now, guess what? When you go and book on train line, and I, you tell me whether it's true on Deutsche Bahn or not, or when you book via Ryanair or British Airways, they don't tell you what the, kilo emi what the emissions are going to be, at the place where you're buying. So just at the point where you're trying to make the decision, there is no information to help you make the sustainable decision. Actually, Trainline had just started doing it for simple journeys, but not the complex one. I had to take three trains to get here um, that, I, that I embarked on. And in fact, what I found was um, a site called EcoPassenger. Um, it didn't take too long to find it, but it was a bit of riffling around on, on Google, so it took a bit of research. And EcoPassenger is very good, so it's got, the, it's got the journey really well laid out here. It tells me exactly, in fact, it gave me information about the exact journey they recommended. I had to scroll all the way to the bottom of the page. Initially, this was below the fold, and it would be on the phone, in order to begin to get some sense of the impact. So top marks for EcoPassenger for do this, bottom marks for design, because I couldn't actually see the information I wanted until I went to the bottom of the page. Now let's look at the bottom of the page and see what you see there. So you can't see here, but let me roughly read it out to you. So this is the key one. This is carbon dioxide, and this is where you get the 31.6 versus the 130 it would have cost to, to come by plane. Helpfully, there's a car alternative as well, which doesn't look very good either from a, from a sustainability perspective. But then you've got energy resource consumption, so that's the amount of energy was required in order for you to get here, as opposed to just the carbon that was emitted. Then you've got particulate matter. I'm, I'm more or less there with particulate matter. I sort of know what that is. Then you've got nitrogen oxides and then non-methane hydrocarbons, and I begin to lose the plot completely. And I know a bit about this area, but I'm beginning to lose, at that stage, I'm losing you know, the, the, the information or understanding really what it is. That's not to criticize EcoPassenger. I think sites like this are amazing, and, and, and they're doing a really good job. Now, then you've got the qualitative measurements that you have to think about as well. So I actually love going by train. I have done for my entire life. I like railway stations. I way prefer them to airports. I think there is a feeling of being in touch with the land when you come by train. I actually got to understand a fair bit about northern Germany, which I've not traveled across slowly before, and it was pretty slow. Um, but I, I got to feel some of it. I know where Aachen is now, and I didn't really know where it was before. Forgive my ignorance, but I, you know, I didn't. And then there was a the comfort. There was more space on the train. It was you know, much better comfort-wise than flying, particularly with, 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 with the budget airline. And that was great. And of course, there's actually health benefits as well. So there's less risk of DVT um, when you're you know, deep vein thrombosis when you're sitting on a train. But then you got the pro-plane argument. So, <laughs> I'm here for two days. I was here yesterday with the conference and again today, but the entire trip is taking me four days. I won't actually get home till midday on Saturday morning. 
So that's eating a big chunk out of the weekend with my kids. I have five of them, and I'm having to sacrifice that in order to take the sustainable alternative. And then there's the other thing, which I ended up wearing a mask non-stop for 12 hours on Wednesday, which was kind of okay, and you sort of accept, and I know that's a, carbon, that's a, a COVID exception, and maybe will go away at some stage in the future. So you've got this balance with enjoyment factors. We have to make it easier for people. You know, this is not easy what I did. I'm really happy I did it. And I'm going back by train this afternoon, by the way, so I'm sticking to the schedule. But, but it's, it's not easy. And, and let's begin to think about this. Um, because businesses have to begin to make it easier. And I'm going to explain why. And we see these, I think of these as five forces now really hitting CEOs and companies hard and saying, you've got to make the transition to a more sustainable future. Um, and those five forces are shareholders. So there was that remarkable day, I'm sure you all caught, I think about a month and a half ago, when um, Exxon and Chevron were both hit hard by shareholders at, the, at their shareholder meeting um, <clears throat> on one day, basically saying, you're not committed to a carbon-free future and you're really going to have to shift your perspective. And they won the day, um, notoriously. Then you've got, um, and we know ESG investing is just going through the roof at the moment. Then you've got governments. Um, so Boris Johnson has mandated, he did it a while back, that uh, the UK, you will not be able to sell um, petrol or diesel cars new in the UK from the beginning of 2030 onwards. And I think we will probably stick to that. That's a major commitment. That must have made all car manufacturers go, OK, that's a major market. Now we're really going to have to change our behavior. So governments are beginning to step in and put, put pressure on, on corporations. Then you've got courts of law. The same day that happened to Chevron and Exxon, you had uh, Shell um, in uh, the Netherlands being hit by their, a court of law there saying, what you are proposing in terms of your speed to carbon neutrality is not fast enough and is actually technically illegal. And, and so they're putting pressure on, on, a, on a major enterprise, you know, a globally famous brand, uh, to make the change. And then you've got employees. You have Amazon employees going on strike last year, not, as you might have thought, to complain about pay and working conditions, but for the environment. And we'll see more of this. We will see more employees putting pressure on their companies to do this. We ran a survey in Accenture Interactive just a few months ago, and we said, what are the areas you most want to see innovation? Sustainability, double the nearest contender in terms of what people wanted to see. The nearest contender, by the way, was Metaverse, and I know that we're going to hear about that in a moment. Um, so employees are putting pressure. And then one which is not remarked on enough in my mind, but anecdotally I'm hearing again and again from CEOs, which is the pressure from children. So our children have listened to Gressa. They're out there now talking about it, acting on it. And, there, and I've heard CEOs say, my family actually saying to me, what is your company doing about this? So that's a great heap of pressure. And then now let's turn to the consumer. So we know that there is, and there is heaps of evidence that consumers are taking sustainability way more seriously in a whole number of different ways. And, and it, they're seeing it across a range of areas. So there is a diversity of, 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 of concerns here. They're concerned about plastic, they're concerned about whether products are actually eco-friendly. They're concerned about the way their food is made. In all sorts of ways, we're seeing and hearing the signals loud and clear from consumers that they care. And they particularly care at the younger end. Now, I've got to say that I, I put this slide in last week because um, this report was released, um, uh, the biggest ever survey into what young people are thinking about sustainability across the planet was released last week. And the thing that really caught my attention was four out of 10 people between the age of 16 to 25 in this survey were saying, I don't think I want to have children because of this world and the way we're going. Th that's, that is an existential threat <laughs> to mankind which sits alongside sustainability and I think is pretty eye-catching. Now, I know also, actually, since then, that I've seen other evidence that is saying, actually, old people are as concerned as young people, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know whether we'll ever get to the exact truth about which generation cares the most, but definitely we're seeing huge levels of anxiety, anxiety being a topic of the day right now, as I'm sure you're aware. We're seeing huge levels of anxiety feeding through to mental health. And I think these things are going to connect a lot. And we're going to hear a lot more discourse about this over the weeks and months and years to come. 
But as you probably knew I was going to say, here's the challenge. Um, if you're a consultant, you probably want to call this the value action gap. If you're a normal person, you probably want to call it the say-do gap. A say one thing, a do something different. And it's pretty wide. So consumers are saying, yes, this matters to us. Sit, you know, way over half are saying, I want to buy from purpose-driven brands that advocate sustainability. But actually, just over, only just over a quarter are putting their money where their mouth is. So this matters. And one of the ways in which it matters is if we go out there and we say, you've got to consume less, it, we're going to struggle. It's not where we've been for 50, maybe 100 years. You tell me a history of capitalism, but you know, however long you want to take that time scale, the, the mass consumption routine that we have at the moment is deeply, deeply embedded in our lives. I think that the trick here is we know more consumption is a problem, but it's a problem not just because it creates unsustainability and damages the planet, but it's a problem because people are not necessarily prepared to go there when they're at the point of sale. And I'm really thinking here about at the point of sale. And, and therefore, I think we need to begin to think philosophically and then practically act on this, that the trick for brands, trick is the wrong word, the strategy for brands is to try to shift consumers towards uh, better, rather than more. And, and the key thing here to understand is that we can't wait for consumers. What's been happening over the last 10, 15 years, we've all heard our companies, other people's companies, say, yeah, 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 we'll do it when consumer demand is there. But we're in a system which feeds consumer demand, and that's how we make our profit. We can't wait, because they're not going to go there fast enough. I've just seen research coming out of Glasgow. We're researching in Glasgow for COP26. We've been doing some deep research in there and Nordics about how people think about sustainability. And I can assure you, everything we're reading says consumers just aren't going to go there fast enough. So what does that mean? Think about those other five forces that I talked about. It means those other five forces, which are real and, and powerful, particularly combined together, those other five forces are going to force enterprises, they are forcing enterprises, to go down the sustainable route faster, much faster, than consumers are going there. So what does that mean? It means you're in the business of behavior change. It means that what we've got to begin to think about is not waiting for the consumer to say, you know, I want this alternative, although some of them are doing that, but actually we've got to be in the business both of behavior change of ourselves as large enterprises, um, and, and, you know, you may well ask, and I can tell you, but I'm not going to today because I think it'd be the wrong thing to talk about, but Accenture is taking major steps to become more sustainable as an organization. That's behavior change within our organization. Probably have some distance to travel, but we're talking about behavior change of customers. So now we're in an interesting space for the advertising, marketing, brand, design community that what we're going to have to begin to do, I would even use the word engineer, is behavior change of consumers around sustainability. And I think that's got to be the goal for us. And it's difficult, because there's a whole lot of things getting in the way. That's why I traveled here by train, because I guessed what was going to happen would happen, and I could tell you this story. But there's, there's other things. So if we just look at the sort of big picture, typically what you hear from consumers when you say, why don't you actually do this, is a bucket of things going, well, it's, it's somebody else's problem. Others aren't doing enough. And, and the others breaks down to three. There's government should do something about it. Businesses don't seem to be doing about it. And that bloke next door, he's not doing enough about it either. So there's a whole array. That's quite a powerful trilogy of others that aren't doing enough in the minds of many consumers. The second thing is disempowerment. It's like, well, that, I, you know, what, it's, too, it's so big. You know, in the headlines, in some ways, we need the headlines, but they don't help. Because when the world is on fire, it's like, well, how can I put that out? That's not going to work. And then you've got a really important one, which is the cost of doing so. You just heard that with my train thing. Actually, I didn't mention on the train thing, because I've had to do two extra hotel nights in order to stay here and then get home. Um, that's another t -t 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 um, 400 euros or so uh, on top of everything else. Now, if I was traveling with my family of, of, of the full family of seven of us, there's no way I'd make that choice. So you've got the expensive bit, and then you've got the inconvenient bit as well. And the inconvenient bit is if it puts people out just a little bit, they're probably not going to go there. 
So what are we going to do about this? Well, I think there are three things we, we need to do. The first is we need to get really, really good at providing information. I do think this is massively an information issue. We've got to provide the information at the point of purchase, at the moment when people are in consideration and are taking those decisions. So where you do that, and remember, this gets complicated because what you do at point of sale in a supermarket is going to be very different from what you do online, for example. In online, you've effectively got infinity to present information to customers if they really want it. On the back of a packet of cereal, you've not got infinity to deal with unless you use AR. But AR is not mainstream yet. Maybe we'll go there. Maybe you know, we'll see. That's maybe a metaverse question. Um, and then you've got to look at, well, what is the right information to give? So when I'm buying a packet of cornflakes, I don't really want or need that much information. When I'm buying a color television and it's costing me maybe 800 euros, maybe then I am prepared to dive in a bit deeper and think about it. So the way we structure and think about the information around sustainability is going to be really, really important here. The second thing we need is standardization and standard measures in particular. So I spent in carbon 31.6 kilos um, uh, of carbon to get here, as opposed to the 130 something it would have cost by plane. Just before I came on stage, I started panicking and thinking, was it really kilos? And I had to go back and have a look at my laptop to make sure that it was actually kilos. Um, and even now, I'm feeling a bit nervous that I'm not fully au fait with what the standards are. Now, there's plenty of other standards in life which we understand completely. So if I said to you I roughly get 29 to 30 MBS at home on my download speeds, most of you go, yeah, I know what that's like. And if I said to you it's three, you'll know that I probably couldn't work from home um, over Teams, for example. So that's a standard we all understand. There's a standard called used by on food. My children go through the fridge regularly looking for the used by dates and throwing out food which has gone past its used by date, which infuriates me. Um, but they, they know and understand that standard, and it's a standard which is used you know, all over the world. So we're going to have to find, because we don't have that sustainable standard. And the thing I was showing you from the eco site, the eco traveler site, I did it deliberately because I wanted to show you, look, there's a whole range of standards measurements across here, but they're actually quite hard to grasp. And hey, I'm trying to make a decision about a trip to Hamburg, and I haven't got that much time to look at all of these. So could you please just give me a number? or a letter, or a rating, which I can then triangulate elsewhere. We have heard this very, very clearly from consumers when we've been doing our, our ethnographic research with them, is they want stuff that they can, um, they can relate to, that, they, that is relatable to other things, so they can triangulate it. And then here's the third one. We have to begin to really understand in depth, and we're busy doing this right now, so I'm just going to show you some early stuff. We have to understand customers' mindsets, because they are radically different, and they also shift from moment to moment, and they also shift by location. So what we've seen, for example, with the research we're doing in Nordics is there is, without going into detail because we don't have time, there is a particular Nordic mentality around sustainability, which is different from what we're seeing in the UK, and I dare say definitely different from what you see in the US or Argentina, for example or China. So we think that locality and location is going to matter a lot, but context matters a lot as well. And you probably can't see, but the, the, the two axes here, which I think are super important, the vertical one is does the consumer focus on the bigger picture in their lives when they think about things, or are they really focusing on immediate needs? And then the horizontal axis is do I feel like I have some control over this, or do I actually feel like I have no control over this whatsoever? And when you use these axes, you can begin to see how consumers fall into, and this is what we've seen in the research, very clearly this range of mindsets where where you sit in these mindsets makes a huge difference to the decisions that you make, and we're going to have to understand these. Because a lot of these mindsets, I mean, pretty much all of them except for Harmony up here, a lot of these mindsets their decision-making is easy around sustainability. They may want to do it, the intention may be there, but it's easily overridden by what they regard as more personally pressing matters, like they're poor, or the kids are shouting, or they just want to do something quickly. These are pretty human things, and, and it's, it's hard to counter them. We found another thing which I found remarkable. They don't think, at least this was in the Nordics, that retail and sustainability are compatible. So therefore, they're just going to go on shopping. 
This is some feedback we got. It's like retail is shopping, is consumption. And, and, and so that can't ever be sustainable because it's consumption. And therefore, we can't do anything about it, so you just have to go on shopping, which is quite an interesting sort of convoluted mental process. But we're going to have to dive into some of these things and get there. Um, and, and also, for many of these mindsets, particularly these people here, the ones who desperately need direction, they're only going to shift as sustainability becomes a social norm. So that's probably the key thing to get changed there. So what we're beginning to look for here, and I suggest it's the work we all have to you know, engage in, is what are the interventions that we need to make? Now that we know what the, the key problem sets are, what are the key interventions that we're going to have to make in order to, in, in order to pursue behavior change? It sounds a bit kind of totalitarian, doesn't it? Behavior change. But I don't think we've got an option if we're going to hit the goals we need to hit in order to get the planet to where we need it to go. Um, and we can't turn back. And this then becomes a very human challenge. And I think that's our challenge. Thank you very much.